Olá, boa tarde a todos. Eu sou o professor Monclar Lopes, docente de língua portuguesa do Departamento de Letras Clássicas e Vernáculas e professor do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Estudos da Linguagem da Universidade Federal Fluminense. E também pesquisador do CCO, Grupo de Pesquisa Conectivos e Conexão de Orações. Quero dar as boas-vindas a todos, os que estão presentes virtualmente, para mais este evento do CCO, em especial a nossa convidada internacional, professora Johanna Bardal, da Universidade de Ghent, Bélgica. O CCO, Grupo de Pesquisa Conectivos e Conexão de Orações, foi fundado no dia 15 de setembro de 2015, no Instituto de Letras da Universidade Federal Fluminense. O CCO é um grupo jovem no cenário acadêmico nacional, mas que já conta com produção acadêmica relevante e tem marcado sua presença na pesquisa nacional. O objetivo do grupo é, como indica a sua própria identificação, investigar o papel dos conectivos na gramática do português e os diversos processos de conexão de orações, nas abordagens tanto sincrônica quanto diacrônica. Partilhamos uma visão funcionalista da linguagem, mas nossas investigações estão sempre abertas ao diálogo com outras vertentes teóricas. Para conhecer mais o nosso trabalho, acesse nossas redes sociais, nosso site, cco.sites.uf.br, nosso Instagram, arroba cco.conectivos, nosso perfil no Facebook, facebookcom conectivos.cco.1 e nosso canal no YouTube, que é o canal que estamos utilizando neste momento. Inspirados em experiências desenvolvidas em algumas universidades do país, os docentes do CCO propõem, no rol de nossas atividades acadêmicas, um encontro de discussão e debate científico de curta duração. Trata-se do Conect, em clara alusão ao nosso objeto central de pesquisa, os conectivos e a conexão de orações. O Conect acontece bimestralmente, sempre com a participação de um pesquisador convidado, de membros do CCO de interessados no tema. É um evento de qualidade, de qualidade, gratuito, o que reforça nosso compromisso fundamental com uma universidade pública e aberta à sociedade. O conhecimento produzido na academia precisa ser capilarizado para além das, nossas, das paredes da instituição. Esse é um dos focos do Conect. Ao contrário do que dizem por aí, trabalhamos muito e somos totalmente responsáveis pelo que produzimos. Nosso trabalho é sério e comprometido, e nosso grande objetivo é render frutos para a sociedade. Um aviso importante para os ouvintes, nesse momento, para garantir seu certificado de forma gratuita, os participantes desta atividade deverão preencher o formulário eletrônico que será postado no chat do YouTube ao longo da atividade. Basta que esse formulário seja preenchido uma única vez. Em até 20 dias, você receberá o certificado de participação em seu e-mail. Hoje é com muita honra que o CCO recebe virtualmente a sua sétima convidada internacional, a professora doutora Johanna Bardal, uma grande referência para os estudos em abordagem construcional da gramática. Agora eu vou passar para o inglês, ok? Our guest is a professor of the Department of Linguistics at Ghent University, Belgium, Professor Bardal has her first degree from the University of Iceland and her PhD degree from Lund University, Sweden, 2001. She has held visiting appointments at Manchester University, University of North Texas, and University of California at Berkeley. Johanna uh, was a postdoctoral researcher from 2003 to 2008, an acting associate professor 2006, and later a research associate professor 2008 to 2003 at the University of Bergen, Norway. Johanna has held an affiliate associate professorship at Lund University since, since 2004, compatible to habilitation in Europe, and an affiliate full professorship at the University of Iceland since 2015. Johanna's research is focused on case marking and its development, the relation between case marking and verbal semantics, 
argument structure, synthetic functions, non-nominative subjects, four meaning correspondences, and productivity and variation in case marking and argument structure, historical comparative linguistics, diachronic construction grammar, as well as synthetic and semantic reconstruction. Professor Johanna Bardal will have about 40 to 60 minutes for her speech. During her talk, participants may write questions in the YouTube chat box. In the end of the talk, some of the questions will be chosen and addressed to our guest. Once again, I would like to thank you, Professor Johanna, and you can start. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I, I, I forgot to to mention the title of your, of your presentation. So the title of, of Professor Johanna's presentation is Argument Structure Constructions in Competition, the Dative, Nominative, Nominative, Dative Alternation in Icelandic and German. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, can I um, see my screen? Yeah, okay, so here is the screen. Uh, and uh, it needs to, um, it looks like I'm not connecting and then I'm not controlling the screen. Um, um, stop sharing. Um, exit full screen. Okay, so, so there was a problem. I, I cannot control my screen. Uh, let me just. Um, Okay. Let me just um, put it into uh, control mode and uh, try to share it again. Uh, oh. I, I guess you're not sharing now. Right. Okay. So let me see. Mm. What is the, the software you are using? Is it PowerPoint? Yeah, yeah, this is just ordinary PowerPoint. Okay. Maybe I should uh, click slides instead of share screens or. Try that. Should okay. just check if it's okay. Uh, you open slides on my computer. No, okay, no, this is not. Uh, okay, this is for uploading. Okay. So, okay, let's uh, share screen. Share screen. Uh, select the window screen. And now I'm selecting the right one. Uh, Hello, and now, um, is this working? Yes, I guess do it's you, working now. So do try. You the, do you see the whole screen? Yes, I see the whole screen. Okay, okay, that's good. So then I can start. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to thank you uh, guys so much for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, it's a real pleasure and I'm very happy to be here. Now, before we start, I'd like to tell you also that uh, this is joint work with Joran Somers and Karpe Jensen. Joran Somers is um, my PhD student at uh, Ghent University, and Karpe Jensen is a um, computational, uh, computational linguist in Oxford. And uh, the work that I'll be presenting here is, um, of course, uh, uh, work in progress. So it's not. So I will not be providing answers to all the questions that we raise, but. Um, but uh, at least we're on our way to uh, try to um, achieve some answers. So um, here's an overview of the presentation. I start with a few words about uh, the goals of, um, uh, of this work. And um, uh, we're focusing on um, a specific type of um, uh, oblique subject construction in Icelandic and German that select for a dative uh, subject-like argument and a nominative object-like argument. Uh, but I will include a short uh, or a brief uh, presentation about oblique subject constructions in general for the uh, um, non-initiated reader, uh, for the no uninitiated audience, just so that everybody knows exactly what kind of structures we're talking about. And um, um, with regard to subjectude, we're interested in uh, the issue of subjectude. We will first and foremost be focusing on word order in this uh, particular research. Um, and um, as I said, um, we have uh, two types of dative nominative verbs in Icelandic. I'll be telling you um, a little bit about uh, more about those in a minute. 
But what we're interested in doing is we're interested in, in looking at corresponding verbal arguments in German and uh, to see uh, how they behave, if they behave the same way as in Icelandic or, or if they behave differently. And so we will be carrying out a frequency study on different word order distributions um, uh, for these particular verbs. Okay. So, as I said, the goal of this presentation is to investigate whether um, dative nominative verbs in German behave in the same way as dative nominative verbs do in Icelandic. And as I just mentioned, we have two sets of dative nominative verbs in Icelandic. So that means that we have so-called uh, uh, um, non-alternating dative nominative verbs. These are verbs where the dative is always the syntactic subject and the nominative is always the syntactic object. I'll be showing you examples of that in a minute. Um, and then we have, and, and these are well known in the literature. These are basically classical dative nominative verbs in Icelandic. And then we have another set of uh, verbs in Icelandic uh, which uh, have been uh, uh, called alternating uh, uh, dative nominative verbs, because they actually um, they actually alternate between two different linear orders, uh, and those uh, two linear orders also uh, um, represent uh, two different argument structure constructions. So we find them in the dative nominative construction, and then the dative is the subject, and the nominative is the object. And we also find them in uh, uh, in the uh, in the nominative dative construction, where the order of the arguments is exactly um, reverse to what it is in dative nominative constructions. And in those cases, it's the nominative that is the subject, and dative the object. And this. This appears, this is really weird uh, in one sense, because one thinks that as soon as we put one of the arguments in front of the other, we, uh, we as soon as we put the, the object in front of the subject, then we have topicalization. But that's actually not what happens with these particular verbs. Instead, when we put the nominative in first position, it becomes a subject and the date of the object and vice versa. So, and as I said, we'll be particularly focusing on the word order test. Uh, we'll be looking at different word order distributions uh, for those uh, verbs in both Icelandic and German. And uh, the goal is, on the one hand, to um, establish uh, how to establish um, whether these verbs, whether corresponding verbs in German uh, really behave like they do in Icelandic or whether they do not behave like in Icelandic. And then uh, um, uh, our ultimate goal is, of course, to uncover the reasons for speakers' choices of the two alternates. Uh, that is, why do speakers choose the dative nominative construction uh, and why do they choose the nominative dative construction? Okay, so um, here I have a slide with a few examples of uh, oblique subject constructions in Icelandic in general. So the first one is meg dreamt die uh, me dreamt uh, uh, skiing trips. The second is Mörgum líkar ekki bragðið. Many people do not like this taste. Hláturs er vorn. Laughter is expected. And um, as you see, uh, the, um, argu the first arguments uh, uh, in the linear order, uh, which also happen to be the subjects, uh, are not in the nominative case. Here we have, in the first example, we have um, accusative. We have an accusative subject, meg. Uh, in the second example, we have a dative subject, mörgum. And in the third example, we have a genitive subject, lauters. Uh, now, um, so, so basically what this means is that uh, these are examples of what is usually referred to in the literature as quirky or oblique subjects. And these are accusative, dative, or genitive. And this is what is generally referred to also in the literature as non-canonical case marking of subjects. And this, of course, also includes then nominative objects. So this is the middle example again. Uh, and here you see that bragdid is in the nominative case. Um, so not only do we have uh, oblique subjects, but we also have nominative objects. And this raises the question, how do we distinguish between nominative subjects and nominative objects in Icelandic? And I'm gonna start with addressing that question before we continue so that uh, there can be, uh, so, that, uh, so that all of this is clear before we uh, continue with the presentation. So here I have two sets of verbs. Uh, to, the, um, to the left, we have a nominative dative verb. This is the verb hjalpa. It means to help. 
and it takes a nominative subject and a dative object. And this is totally uncontroversial, and we have this uh, verb Hjalpa in several other languages, also with dative objects, related languages, including German. And I'll be showing you examples of that a little bit later. Uh, on the left, uh, uh, in, on the left side, we have uh, the verb liga that you saw earlier, uh, which is a dative nominative verb. And if we start with the example in one a um, with hjalpa, uh, we have we see maðurinn hefur hjálpað konunni. Uh, maðurinn is in the nominative case; it precedes the finite verb hefur, whereas konunni, the dative, immediately follows the uh, the non-finite verb. And if we look at the example, uh, uh, if we look at the example with Lika, we see that we have exactly the same pattern, except that the case marking is uh, is um, um, uh, is reversed. So manninum is a dative. Manninum have a Lika konan. Manninum is the dative. It uh, immediately precedes the uh, the finite verb, and then we have the nominative konan, which immediately follows the non-finite verb. And this is both of these examples are. are um, um, neutral word order. This is neutral word order. This is basically default word order in Icelandic for both these verbs. And we see that the subject, be it nominative or dative, is systematically uh, immediately preceding the finite verb and the object uh, uh, immediately uh, follows the non-finite verb. So, um, looking at the next set of examples, the examples in 1b and 2b, uh, this, these examples involve a topicalization of the object. So, starting with the, with the one with Hjalpa, the, the object uh, here was Konun uh, in the dative case. This object has now been topicalized to first position in 1B, Konun hefur maðurin Hjalpað. What happens in those cases is that the, nom that the subject, be it nominative or dative, has to immediately follow the non-finite verb. This is basically called subject verb inversion. So if something else is in first position, uh, the subject uh, inverts with the verb. And we see exactly the same pattern in 2b with lika. Uh, the nominative object here is uh, occurs in first position, konan, uh, konan hefur manin um lika, and we see that the dative immediately follows the finite verb. Um, if uh, if it was the dative that was the object and nominative and the nominative of the subject, uh, we would be uh, we would be getting structures like those in 2C. Kornan have a legal maninum. And you see that this is ungrammatical. But before we get to that, I wanted to <laughs> continue with the presentation here. Uh, so this is uh, topicalization. This is not uh, default. Uh, this is not neutral word order, but topicalization. There's something special going on in the examples in in the B examples. Uh, and as I said, if Conan uh, uh, was the subject in the nominative here, and Manina was the object, this should be a grammatical structure because you see that this is exactly the same as here in one A, uh, nominative in first position, dative in the final position. Nominative in first position in 2C, dative in final position, but in this case, in 2C, this is ungrammatical. And uh, for the uh, verb, for the Hjalpa verb, konune in the, uh, uh, the, the, the dative object konune in um, first position uh, is ungrammatical if the nominative immediately follows the non finite verb. So if the order of subject and uh, subject and object is reversed, then is totally reversed. Then the these structures are ungrammatical. So so uh, uh, so if we topicalize either the dative object or the nominative nominative object, the subject has to immediately follow the finite verb. So these uh, two structures uh, are ungrammatical. Uh, and as I already said, the, the the subject test here is basically first position in declarative clauses and subject verb inversion. And um, we will be. Um, it has been argued that first position in declarative clauses and subject verb, or at least first position in declarative clauses, cannot be used as a subject test in German um, because you can put everything in first position, uh, all kinds of things, but. Um, you can, of course, also do that in Icelandic. You can topicalize all kinds of things into first position. But the point is not necessarily that it's first position per se, but rather that 
when the subject is in first position, we get neutral word order. So um, it is possible to use this test in German, uh, even though something else can be put in first position because what we do find is that if the object is put into the first position, we, we don't get neutral word order. So then we get some sort of an, a different kind of intonation telling us that this is, uh, this is not neutral word order and this is not the subject. Uh, now we are not gonna, we're not gonna be using the, uh, the word order test this way today. Uh, instead, what we wanna do is we want to have a look at uh, frequency distributions across positions. Uh, and uh, see if, um, if uh, uh, to which degree uh, the different uh, uh, verbs have uh, the different arguments in different positions. So that's basically what the study later on is going to be about. Okay, so uh, now, um, as I just said, uh, lika is a, a non-alternating verb. It's a classical non-alternating verb, non-alternating dative nominative verb with the nominative with the dative in first position and uh, uh, immediately preceding the finite verb and bragde the test follows the um, follows the non-finite verb now um, i also showed you an example where the reverse of course does not work with nominative in first position and the dative in final position now that of course does not mean that uh, the nominative cannot be uh, cannot be topicalized to first position of course it can uh, but what then, what we have to do is we have to have uh, the dative immediately following the um, non-finite, the finite verb. So as in subject verb inversion. Okay, so um, th th that was, those were classical, that was uh, Liga, classical dative nominative verb. Now I want to show you uh, some examples of uh, the alternating verbs. And... Um, uh, that is the verbs that alternate between the dative nominative and the nominative dative. And I'm going to, I'll be showing you that there's a little bit of a difference here with regard to those. And that this difference is an argument for saying that these uh, uh, verbs alternate between two, um, between two, uh, uh, between these two argument structure constructions. Now notice that um, the verb that we have here is the verb henta, and it means to suit or befit. And um, uh, so if we take the first example here, summum skipsturum, how the henta vel theta veida fare. This means some skippers had found this fishing gear quite suitable. So the dative here is some skippers, and the nominative theta veida fare means uh, um, this fishing gear. Um, now, what you see here is that we have the dative in the position preceding the finite verb, and we have the nominative in the position immediately following the uh, non-finite verb, exactly as with lika. But we can also get exactly the opposite word order. And here I have an another example. Both of these examples are tested examples from modern Icelandic. Uh, this example, also with the verb henta, as you can see, uh, goes like this. Namskeve have the henta öllum foreldrum ungra barna. The course had been suitable for all parents with young children. The course is here in the nominative case, as you can see, immediately preceding the finite verb. And atlum foreldrum ungra barna is in the dative case, immediately following the, uh, the uh, non-finite verb. So basically, uh, here we have something that was ungrammatical with lika, namely the exact uh, reverse order of the arguments. And this suggests that in this example, the dative is the subject and the nominative is, is the object, whereas in the other example, the nominative is the subject and the dative is the object. Um, now, I want to show you a few more examples with, uh, with, uh, um, with this particular example, the first example. Um, now, if we just play around a little bit with this example, just to show you what happens, we can also, uh, of course, uh, reverse the order of the arguments here. We can say theta veida fare, which is the nominative. You can have that in first position. Theta veida fare have the henta summum skipsturum vel. And here we see the non-finite verb, and we see that the dative summum skipsturum, some skippers, uh, immediately follows the uh, the um, non-finite verb. So this, in this case, we have theta veida fare, theta veida fare as the subject, and summum skipsturum as the object. Now I now I have um, the the first paper that I wrote about those uh, alternating verbs. 
uh, came out actually in 2001. Uh, it's almost awful to think about it, but that's like 20 years ago. Now, in that paper, I went through um, all of the subject properties that are that are used in modern Icelandic, and I sh and I indeed I used the verb hefta, uh, and I showed that uh, with regard to the subject properties that when we have the dative nominative order is the dative that passes the subject tests, and when we have the nominative dative order is the nominative that passes the subject tests, and so if I have already established it's already been established for modern Icelandic that. Uh, these are really alternating predicates. Uh, uh, but today, I, we will only be talking about word order. But just so that you keep in mind that, irrespective of word order, it has been shown that uh, with uh, with further subject tests, that the dative is the subject in dative nominative order, and the nominative is the subject in nominative dative order. Okay, so these two examples uh, had exactly the opposite word order, and they're both equally grammatical. Now, remember that with hen with uh, Lika and uh, Hjalpa, this was ungrammatical. When we, the the, when we reverse the order of the arguments, uh, the the uh, 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 the second example with the reversed word order was was ungrammatical. But here it's not. Okay. Now, we can also put together an example where we have uh, the dative in first position, and instead of having the nominative immediately following the non-finite verb, we try to we put it here immediately after the uh, after the finite verb, which is what we would get in subject verb inversion. So if these examples were grammatical, then then Summum Skipstern would be would be um, had been topical as the first position, and Theta Vedafari would uh, be the subject and would immediately follow the verb. But the problem is that this example is not entirely um, uh, grammatical. Summum Skipstern have Theta Vedafari Hentavel. Okay, I'm not. It's not totally out, but it's a very very marked structure, uh, and it's definitely not a neutral word order. So if we uh, try to uh, um, replace the, if we try to reverse the order of the arguments, and now we have Theta Vedafad in first position, and we put Summum Skip theorem, some skippers, uh, in the inverted position immediately following the finite verb, we get the structure Theta Vedafad have the Summum Skip theorem Henta Vel. Now this example is not totally ungrammatical, but as I said again, this is also very marked. Uh, and um, and I interpret this as, as in such a way that as soon as we put one argument in the pre-verbal position uh, uh, preceding the finite verb, the other argument wants to be in the uh, in the object position following the non-finite verb, and not and does not want to invert with the verb, um, uh, which uh, shows that um, when when we put the dative in first position, it's it's assigned the subject role. And when you put the nominative in first position, it's assigned the subject role. Okay, so now I'm actually showing you a little bit about, uh, now I've told you uh, how alternative verbs behave uh, in Icelandic. So um, as I said, uh, to, to, to sum up so far, um, we have oblique subjects in Icelandic. They can be in the accusative dative or the genitive case. Um, we also have uh, dative nominative verbs uh, like lika, uh, which are uh, non alternating uh, 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 dative nominative verbs. And then we can, we also, of course, have ordinary nominative dative verbs like hjalpa, which consist, which consist, where the, the subjects consist consistently in the nominative and the object is consi consistently in the dative. But with regard to dative nominative verbs, we have those two types. We have lika, which is non-alternating, and uh, henta, which is alternating. Okay, so uh, now let's go onwards to German uh, and have a look at the, what kind of uh, uh, case frames we get uh, for German. So in the first examples here, mich friert das, uh, mir ist kalt, and der ma de Mann gefällt das Buch. Uh, we see that uh, in the first example, mich is in the accusative case, mir in mir's kalt is in the dative case, and the man uh, in the man gefällt das Buch is in the is in the dative case. And if you look closer, you also see that das Buch is also in the nominative case. So here we have a dative nominative structure. The question is then, um, 
does gefallen in German behave like Liga in Icelandic or does it behave like Henta? Is it an non-alternating verb like Liga or is it an alternating verb like Henta? That's the question that we want, we want, to, find, we want to find out. One of the questions that we want to address. Now, uh, uh, these, these are, this is not the only example that we have of dative nominative structures. Um, here I have some more. Uh, dem Designer gelang, uh, gelang ein schlichtes Meisterwerk. Uh, the dative here is, uh, um, is in boldface and the nominative is underlined. And this means the designer succeeded with a simple masterpiece. Uh, vielen behagt die Vorstellung. Many people were pleased with the performance. Dative nominative also. Now these are very common. Uh, uh, these are very common uh, verbs, uh, dative nominative verbs in German. And then um, a further example is with the verb drohen, uh, which usually means to threaten. But in this particular structure, with a dative and a nominative, it does not mean does not mean to threaten. Uh, so in this example here, den straf den straftäten drohen Geldbuschen. Uh, this this example means of offenders risk facing fines or offenders uh, face, face fines. Um, and here's another, uh, another one, Lili and für ein Seufzer. And this example, I can hear Lili is in the dative case and ein Seufzer is in the nominative. And this basically means like Lili accidentally let out a sigh or something like that, or happened to, to let out a sigh. Now, um, so the first thing that we wanted to do at this point was to try to figure out, you know, how many uh, uh, dative nominative verbs are there in German? And more importantly, which are those? Uh, so this is, uh, the, this is where Joran uh, came in, Joran Somers, and he started looking for dative nominative verbs in German because we wanted to find out whether they behave like Lika in Icelandic or Henta. Now, um, we started uh, uh, with a paper that I wrote and came out in 2004, where I have a list of, uh, uh, of um, dative subject verbs in German. I think that if I remember correctly, that these were like uh, eight, somewhere between 80 and 100. Um, and then uh, what uh, uh, Joren did was that he looked, uh, in, um, he'd looked in different dictionaries and he looked at, he searched for verbs that were cognates to the Icelandic ones uh, or synonymous with the Icelandic ones in order to um, uh, to um, find out whether they be whether they uh, were dative nominative verbs or not, and and uh, um, he also did some corpus research and he also checked some additional sources on uh, 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 sources where uh, these kind of structures are discussed. Now. Um, and now this is where it gets interesting. So it turns out that there are 146 verb types uh, uh, of this type uh, in, in, uh, uh, in German, which is much more than we were ever expecting to find. Um, and in addition to that, not only uh, are there 146 verbs, but it turns out that some of those are even polysemous. Uh, and they can have different senses. So together with the different senses, we're up to 202 uh, types, we can say. So just to give you an example of, um, of a verb that is polysemous, so schmecken means to taste in German. And we can say, mir schmeckt diese, diese Suppe nicht, which means, uh, um, this is a perception verb, which means I don't find this soup uh, tasteful. Um, and then we can also use it uh, not as a perception verb, but more like an, an, an emotion verb. Uh, so the example, the next example uh, is der uh, Bundesregierung schmecken diese Reformen nicht. And this basically means the, the, um, uh, the government uh, does not like this reform. And so here schmecken means to find, like, find likable. So in the first example, it's a perception verb. And the second example is an emotion verb. Uh, but we also have the kind of examples where um, where we have dative nominative verbs that uh, uh, that uh, um, have um, the right sense when only when they're dative nominative, and then when we use them as nominative dative verbs, they they mean something different, like drawn, as I mentioned. So that's also a complicating factor in this um, in this research. Now here I have. Um, 
Here I have um, um, a little map of uh, the different categories that um, have uh, different lexical semantic verb classes that have been uh, uh, documented for Icelandic and not only Icelandic, but also for the early um, Indo-European languages. So I'm not actually listing everything here, but um, uh, I'm listing what is um, important for, for this study. Uh, so the most important ones are the experience-based predicates here to, to the right. And uh, we have uh, verbs of emotions, attitudes, cognition, perception, bodily states, changes in bodily states. Um, another, um, another class of verbs that is also uh, rather prominent is um, uh, are verbs that are called happenstance uh, verbs. So these um, are not really experiential verbs, but they express some gain or benefit, um, something happening uh, accidentally, some hindrances that people don't control, uh, success, which is not uh, necessarily controllable, in the, well, at least not with the date of separate construction. And then uh, there are some modal verbs expressing obligation, permission, necessity, possibility. There are evidential, uh, evidential verbs like seem and think, possession verbs, uh, both uh, expressing um, possession and lack of possession. And it turns out that uh, the, uh, uh, the German verbs uh, fit these classes really well. So here I have a list of all of these 146 verbs. I'm not going to go through this whole list. I'm just going to tell you that here you have some examples of, uh, uh, of experiential verbs. Behagen is here, up here, means to, to, to be, to like. Ifallen, to like or please. Ekel, to find something disgusting. Uh, gra, uh, gra, uh, no, Ekel, to find something, uh, uh, to, yeah, to find something disgusting. And Grausen also, to find something disgusting and so on. Uh, here we have cognition verb. Uh, at the top, we have anen, which means to suspect, uh, klaverden, to see something clearly, and so on. And here we have uh, verbs uh, of success, which are extremely interesting. We have three verbs of, of success that are basically synonymous, gelingen, geraden, and glücken. And verbs of failure, the opposite of success, miss, uh, uh, glücken, misslingen, and missraten. And so um, if we... Um, if we take uh, these 146 uh, verbs uh, and including the 202 verb senses and we, um, uh, and we see how they fare with regard to these the, the, uh, the classification that has been put forward on the basis of Icelandic and several early Indo European languages, we basically see that German, uh, uh, the, the German verbs uh, really fit this uh, semantic classification well. So most of the verbs are emotion verbs, and that's also the typical for all the other languages. And then we have cognition verbs, verbs of gain and benefit, happening, hindrance, attitude, possession, perception, bodily state, modal modality, and so on. Okay, so now um, we get to this interesting question, namely, are these verbs uh, in German alternating or non-alternating? And in order to address that question, we um, we look at word order distribution and frequencies. So, um, as I already said, Icelandic has a three-part system. We have ordinary nominative dative verbs like uh, help. We have dative uh, nominative verbs like lika, uh, like. And we have alternating dative nominative slash nominative dative verbs like hetta. So the question is, is it just German, uh, 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 is German a two-part system or three-part system? So does German also have all of those three or does it only have two? And if it has only two, would it then have nominative dative verbs and non-alternating dative nominative verbs? Or if it's only a two-part system, does it have nominative dative verbs and then dative nominative slash nominative dative verbs? So this is, so basically this last part is, okay, so if German is a two-part system, uh, it has nominative dative verbs, and the, the dative nominatives are these uh, alternating or non-alternating. So, um, 
As I already said, uh, with alternating verbs, either the dative or the nominative of hentata verbs, they pass all the behavioral subject tests in Icelandic. And uh, uh, but whereas for non-alternating verbs, only the dative uh, of uh, lika passes the behavioral subject tests in Icelandic. Now, with regard to uh, German, um, the general assumption in the German scholarship is that the dative of dative nominative verbs, like you fallen, is not a behavioral uh, subject, but is a topicalized object instead. Um, now, notice that these two, uh, to, to, these two potential analysis, topicalized object analysis versus a subject analysis, these make different predictions regarding word order distribution and frequencies. So if these are behavioral subjects, we would expect them to more or less uh, be in first position uh, uh, more or less all the time, or at least um, at least to the same, uh, same frequency uh, as the nominative of, uh, of, of help. Right, but if they are topicalized objects, we would expect them to be uh, equally frequent in first position as uh, ordinary topicalized objects are. So, therefore, we actually need to um, to establish a baseline for um, how frequent topicalization is uh, and how frequent a neutral word order is in both of those languages. Um, so here is a list of uh, some of the uh, subject tests that uh, have been used to um, to, to uh, discuss um, oblique subjects in both Icelandic and German. And as I said, it's first position declarative clauses, subject verb inversion, and first position and subordinate clauses, that is the word order test. But again, we're not going to particularly discuss subject pos uh, first position versus subject verb inversion. We're rather going to have a look at uh, the frequencies uh, the frequencies of these, the frequencies of the, the distribution of the different arguments in different positions and how frequent they are. And we're going to compare those with ordinary um, nominative uh, subject verbs. So in the remainder of this presentation, I focus on word order distribution and frequencies. The goal is to compare word order distributions of dative nominative verbs in Icelandic and German, both alternating and non-alternating. So in order to do that, we use ordinary nominative dated verbs like, uh, uh, like help as a control verb. Uh, uh, and this is, of course, due to the fact that it is uncontroversial that the nominative is the subject of uh, help and the dative is the object. So in order to establish a baseline for how common topicalization is, uh, we investigate the frequency of topicalizations with our control set. Uh, which yields linear date non word order with verbs like help. And then we compare word order frequencies, both neutral word order and topicalization of help, with the frequencies found for both alternating and non alternating verbs across Icelandic and German. Okay, so now we're getting to the more exciting stuff. So we collected 15 verbs, and they come from three different verb classes. So we have nominative dative verbs, ordinary nominative dative verbs. We have the verb hjálpa, uh, help, as I talked about, líkjast, which means to resemble, mótmæla, which means to contradict, tresta, which means to trust, and þakka, which means to thank. So these are... These are all nominative. These these are all verbs that take nominative subjects and dative objects in um, in modern Icelandic. And then uh, for um, non-alternating dative nominative verbs, um, we use the verb auskotnas, which means to receive, bluskra, which means to be shocked or horrified, leidans, be bored, lika, like, and thekja, which means think or find or seem. And for the alternating verbs. We used duga, which means to suffice or be enough. Diljast, which means which means to be hidden. Entast, which means to last. Hetta, that's the word that the word that I already mentioned that means suit or befit. And naya, which um, is more or less synonymous with the duga, and means uh, to be enough or to be sufficient. And in order to, and for ease of uh, explication, we're simply talking about those as hjalpa verbs, lika verbs, and henta verbs. And uh, um, 
Then uh, we uh, also gathered 15 verbs from German and uh, we uh, aimed for um, verbs that were uh, had a semantic or an etymological link with the Icelandic types. So were either synonymous verbs or, or cognates. So for nominative dative verbs, we chose enelln, which means resemble, danken, uh, which is uh, cognate, helfen, which is cognate, uh, vertrauen, which is also cognate, and widersprechen, which is not cognate, but synonymous. And uh, for to choose something that might be equivalent of the uh, Icelandic dative nominative verbs, we went for dunken, which is cognate with the thekja, gefallen, which is uh, synonymous with lika, grauen, which means to dread, uh, light tune, which means to be sorry, and sufallen, to be awarded something. And then uh, for potential dative nominative, nominative dative verbs that is alternating, we went for entgehen, which means fail to notice, genügen, be enough, this one is also cognate to naya, gesiemen is synonymous with henta, nutzen, be of use, and drachen, be enough. So we will also be referring to those as helfen verbs, gefallen verbs, and gesiemen verbs. And here you can see that which of them are cognates and which of them are near synonyms. Okay, so uh, we, um, we um, start out with three different hypotheses. Uh, now the first hypothesis is that uh, verbs like uh, Icelandic Hjalpa verbs um, that uh, which we know um, instantiate the nominative dative argument structure. Um, our hypothesis for those is that those will most likely uh, occur um, in, uh, in a linear order where the nominative precedes the dative. So nominative dative linear order. Uh, so we're assuming that in this case that the linear that the linear order reflects the argument structure. Now for dative uh, dative nominative verbs like lika. Um, our uh, second hypothesis is that those will tend to occur with a dative nominative linear or with, an, with a um, dative nominative linear order in, in our texts, uh, because these are dative nominative verbs, and we assume that the uh, that the linear order uh, reflects the argument structure. And uh, then the um, part B of this hypothesis is that German gefallen verbs behave the same way as uh, Lika verbs. Now, and then the third hypothesis uh, is that alternating verbs like Icelandic henta and most likely German gesiemen verbs, that they will actually uh, not show uh, a skewness towards either nominative dative or dative nominative like uh, like Hjalpa and uh, Lika are expected to do, but that there will be more even distribution between the uh, two constructions. And so um, we're assuming this for for Henta and uh, also um, the German Gesiemen verbs. So these are the hypotheses that we set out testing. Now we have gathered example from uh, from cor from corpora. Uh, we used um, uh, comparable corpora in the sense that we used uh, uh, the German Ten Ten uh, corpus from two thousand and thirteen. And the Icelandic 1010 corpus from 2020. Uh, these are um, these are web. This is a this is a web corpus, so it actually gathers examples from the from the internet. And uh, the German one has 16 billion words, and the Icelandic one has 520 million words. And one of the uh, one of the uh, major advantages of this uh, corpus is that th it is lemmatized, so you can actually search for a specific lemma. Now. Uh, what we did was that we searched for uh, the relevant lemmas and we um, um, ended up, so basically we uh, searched for, we, we, came, we, we, we searched for those lemmas, we extracted uh, 1,000 examples and then we uh, went through those examples and uh, used, extracted the first 200 eligible tokens of each type. So this means that we have 200 tokens for each uh, of, of these types. And we have uh, 15 types for Icelandic. So that means that we have 3,000 observations for Icelandic and we have 3,000 observations for German. So in total, we have 6,000 observation in total. And uh, 
Uh, and um, one of the things that we also um, annotated the material for was uh, whether the argument was a pronoun or a full NP. And that basically that means that we can have the kind of situation where, there are, where both arguments are pronouns or where both arguments are, are NPs, uh, or that one of the argument is a pronoun and the other is an NP. Either the one in first position in, is a pronoun or the one in second position is a pronoun. Now, um, there is, um, there is um, constraint in German uh, with regard to the order of uh, pronouns. And so because of that, um, we think that the most important, uh, uh, the, it's most important to actually use full NPs, but I will also be showing you some, some examples of pronouns as well, some uh, frequencies for pronouns as well, just to, to help, to, just to see the difference. So here we have some general frequencies for the verb hjalpa uh, in Icelandic. Uh, and uh, this is uh, irrespect. This is this is irrespective of uh, whether the. Th so this is basically for the all. This is basically for all uh, instances of uh, hjalpa verbs. Uh, so this would be to, uh, one thousand instances, and it's this is irrespective of whether the argument is uh, is uh, um, coded as a pronoun or a full NP. Now, what's interesting, if we just go word by word, we see that hjalpa occurs in the nominative in the nominative dative linear order 99.5% of the cases and we only find one example of topicalization where the dative uh, uh, precedes the nominative in the linear order that's uh, less than 1% topicalization for hjalpa Ligast, uh, more or less the all our 200 examples are uh, nominative dative uh, Motmaila, we actually have up to 10 examples of topicalization, so 95% neutral word order and 5% topicalization. Uh, both Trist and Thaka occur 100% of the time in the, um, in the nominative, with a nominative data linear order. So as you can see here, uh, there's a very clear uh, tendency towards, uh, uh, nominative, uh, towards nominative data linear order for Verbs, which is exactly what we would expect. Now, if we have a look at the um, for two full MPs, um, we see that the numbers are, are, are very similar. Um, it varies, of course, for each verb, how many examples we had with two full MPs. We only had 25 with Hjalpa, but uh, up to 125 with Likast. And uh, generally uh, here, we get the same pattern as uh, with the general frequencies, Motmaila, Vita uh, Sprechen to um, oppose uh, uh, has 2% uh, 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 examples of topicalization, which is, which is not a lot. So then let's have a look at uh, how Lika verbs behave. Um, so these are the non-alternating verbs. Um, if you have, if we start with the linear order here, we see that uh we we have a we have we have similar numbers in one sense we have three examples of uh, nominative dative uh, uh for for ausgotnast which is uh, 1.5% of the total uh we have one uh, topicalization for bluskra we have seven for leidas be bored and seven for lika which is like 3.5% uh, for Thekia, we have actually uh, a bit more skewed um, or a bit less skewed, uh, we can say, uh, frequencies with 25% uh, of the instances uh, of Thekia uh, being topicalized to the nominative dative, uh, topicalized occurring in a nominative dative linear order. Uh, but still, it's very clear that 75% of the 75% uh, of the cases uh, we find uh, uh, Thekia uh, um, with the dative nominative linear order. So clearly Thekia is a little bit of an outlier here. Um, and there can be different reasons for that. But for the other four verbs, we see that the numbers are basically exactly uh, the opposite than they are for, 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 uh, for, for Hjalpa verbs. And that's of course expected because Hjalpa verbs are nominative dative and Lika verbs are, are dative nominative. But it, what we see here is that there's a very clear uh, majority uh, of examples uh, in one of the one of the uh, uh, linear orders. 
Okay, so then we can have a look at the uh, uh, the full and piece also for Liga verbs. And we see that here the numbers are even more clear cut. Uh, still, uh, with Thekia we uh, uh, we have <coughs> with Thekia we have uh, one example of topicalization. Uh, so clearly, all these examples uh, of um, um, nominative dative linear order with Thekia, which we saw in the earlier slide, um, is um, basically due to pronouns. And it turns out that these are particularly demonstratives. So this or that. Now. Okay, so let's now have a look at hetta verbs, which which is the alternating verbs. So if you have a look at our general frequencies, irrespective of uh, of uh, the type of uh, of noun or pronoun, we see that we have um, for duga we get nineteen ten percent, nineteen versus ten. For dilias we get seventy five versus twenty five. For antas we get thirty nine versus sixty one. For hetta we get one hundred percent versus zero. And for Naya, we get 70 versus 30. So here, things actually start looking a little bit different from what we saw earlier, in that there's more uh, variation between the uh, two linear orders. And this becomes even clearer if we uh, have a look at uh, full and piece, which we'll, we'll be doing in the next slide. But before that, notice that Henta is a bit of an outlier here, in that it always occurs with the, with the, in with in the nominative dative order and never with the dative nominative order, which is kind of which is kind of strange. But at this point, we don't know if if this um, um, uh, what this reflects. But as a native speaker of Icelandic, I can uh, vouch that uh, uh, both orders are equally neutral. Um, and if and if they weren't, I would never have used Hatta in that paper twenty years ago, which I, which is what I did. So, um, but Hatta is some sort of an outlier, uh, uh, which we find always with the nominative dative word order, even though the dative nominative order is equally neutral, as I said. Now, if we look at the full and p condition, we see that the numbers are are much. The numbers get more. The numbers get even clearer. So. So for Duga, we are up to 80 versus 20%, Dilias 25, 75%, and does 30 uh, uh, versus 70%, and 54 versus 46%. So you see that there's a very clear difference here between the Hanta verbs uh, as opposed to both the Liga and Hjalpa in that there is a, uh, in that there's a skewness, in that there's less in that the, um, the frequencies are less skews, they're more even. Um, and uh, we also see that the numbers 21, 25, 30, uh, 46, they're actually much higher than the topicalization numbers. So there's no way that we can say that one of the orders is uh, um, is default word order and the other is uh, a topicalization. Uh, because we, we already saw the topicalization are at most 5% in the Icelandic examples that we just um, showed you above for both Liga and um, for both uh, uh, Hjalpa and Henta. Okay, so um, so on this basis, it seems that well, uh, the first hypothesis uh, about Hjalpa verbs is uh, borne out. Uh, the second hypothesis about dative nominative verbs about uh, uh, dative nominative verbs is also borne out. And the third analysis about alternating verbs also seems to be borne out, but it needs to be investigated further. So let's now turn to the German uh, to the to the German verbs and let's see what happens there. Um, so starting with general frequencies, uh, we see that enel um, always uh, occurs in the nominative dative linear order. Duncan has um, some. 7.5% uh, examples of topicalization. Uh, Helfen has 5.5% uh, examples of topicalization. Vertrauen, 8%. And for Vitasprechen, we have the most ones, 14%. This was actually the same as with Icelandic. So the synonymous uh, verb for Vitasprechen, uh, Motmaila in Icelandic, also was the one that was highest in uh, uh, with regard to uh, topicalization. So these were the general frequencies. Now, if we have a look at the uh, if we have a look at the uh, uh, the frequencies for full nouns, 
I uh, think the, we see that the numbers go down because uh, several of those are, of course, involved pronouns. So we see that we still have, we have zero uh, topical relaxation with enel, we have 4% with Duncan, 4% with Helfen, 2% with Vertrauen, and we're up to at most 10% with Widersprechen. So with these uh, five verbs in German, we've shown that uh, topical relaxation is never higher than 10% for this particular verb class. Okay, so let's uh, uh, con let's go onwards to Gefallen then. So here I have general frequencies with uh, uh, Gefallen. Uh, we for Duncan we have seventy five nominative dative word order and twenty five percent dative nominative. Oof, that's a lot higher than the ten percent topicalization than we that we had with uh, uh, Helfen. And we have with Gefallen sixty one versus sixty one versus thirty nine percent. Uh, Grauen, 16.5 versus 83%. Uh, Leitun, 93 versus 6.5%. Zufallen, 61% versus 38%. So actually, it looks like from these numbers that these particular verbs, that all these verbs uh, are maybe alternating verbs, which, would, which is not what we hypothesized. We hypothesized that Gefallen verbs in German uh, and we selected those five as representatives, we hypo hypothesize that these might be non-alternating groups, non-alternating dative nominative groups, but that does not seem to be borne out. Now let's have a look at, in order to, um, to, to conform this, uh, let's um, have a look at um, the, um, uh, the, the uh, full NPs. Now before that though, there is a grauen, is a little bit of a special verb in that the nominative uh, in the nominative data construction is always uh, an expletive. So, um, so, um, so this is a little bit of a different constru different construction than than the others. Now, if you look at the uh, the full end piece, we see that only three of those verbs uh, uh, instantiated two full end piece. Now, Duncan, uh, the numbers are forty five versus fifty five. Gefallen, the numbers are forty seven fifty three. And so far, the numbers are 62, 38. We see very clearly that these verbs appear to be alternating verbs and not non-alternating verbs, as we hypothesized. And then let's have a look at Gesiemen verbs. Uh, here we have some general frequencies for, for, for Gesiemen verbs, which uh, we hypothesized were alternating. And we uh, get 48 versus 52%, 55 versus 45 uh, 60 versus 40, 90 versus 10, uh, 57 versus uh, 43. So it seems that these numbers, they all support, except for maybe for Knudsen, that these are alternating uh, alternating predicates. We did see for we did see for uh, Vitasprechen uh, with Helfen that we could have 10 percent uh, uh, 10 percent topicalization there. So clearly, with numbers like 90, 10, uh, the numbers are not. But the numbers do not really uh, 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 tell us whether something is a, an alternating verb or whether it is um, uh, or whether it, there is topicalization involved. But for all the other verbs, this is pretty clear. And uh, and here we have the numbers for the full MPs: uh, 40 versus 60, 55 versus 45, 56 versus 44. Now for Nutschen here, things are actually clear, more clear cut. We have 83 versus 17%. And uh, for Rach and for Rachen, 38 versus 62%. Um, and so um, it seems uh, clear that our first hypothesis that nominative dative verbs tend uh, to occur in with the nominative dative linear order is borne out. Uh, uh, our second hypothesis is not borne out. Gefallen verbs do not are clearly not dative nominative verbs, but are alternating verbs instead. Now the alternating verbs are also <laughs> turn out to be of of, of, uh, of the alternating type. The ones that we hypothesized would be alternating verbs, but this needs to be investigated further. So um, here I have um, a summary. This is a summary of the frequencies in the full in the uh, full NP conditions for. Uh, Hjalpa and the Liga verbs. This is only for Icelandic. Uh, so Hjalpa verbs, we have 99.9% uh, uh, nominative dative 
and half a percent data denominative. This is these numbers are numbers for numbers across the ver, across all the verbs in a, in a verb class. For Lika verbs, we had for full and piece basically exactly the same numbers, but uh, uh, but uh, uh, reversed. Uh, when the when both arguments are full and piece, uh, there's only half a percent topicalization for both Hjalpa and legal verbs. Now, for hand the verbs, we have 72 percent nominative dative and 28 percent dative nominative. If we take out uh, uh, hand which is an outlier, uh, we get uh, numbers that are more similar to German, namely 54 versus 46 percent. So these are clearly uh, alternating verbs. Now, um, I wanted to show you also something uh, uh, about uh, pronouns. Um, I haven't actually shown you the numbers for pronouns, but uh, in general, but I have a um, concluding slide here with the examples, uh, with the numbers for, uh, for, the, for the condition where both arguments are pronouns. Now for Hjalpa verbs, uh, we have um, the same situation as we had with full nouns. Uh, almost 100% are nominative dative and less than 1% is dative nominative. For Liga verbs, we have a little bit of a difference. Here, 20% of the examples occur in the nominative dative linear order, uh, whereas only 80% of the examples uh, uh, occur in the dative nominative linear order. So remember that we had Thekia, which uh, uh, was an outlier and uh, was very common with uh, uh, with um, um, uh, in the uh, with the nominative dative linear order, and this is uh, clearly involves pronouns, as you can see here, and uh, and since pronouns are of course uh, uh, more uh, pr pronouns are of course uh, definite and known, so these are of course more likely to be topicalized. But for there is something very interesting about hentha verbs that I that is that I would like to show you here, and that is that when uh, uh, the two arguments are pronouns, we get to a huge degree we get the nominative data uh, uh, construction. So when the two uh, arguments are pronouns, it seems that there's not so much of a choice anymore between the two argument constructions. Uh, instead, the choice is there for full and piece, and maybe also for the mixture of and piece and and uh, um, and, and uh, pronouns. So this is something that is really weird in our data set. And one of the things that we have been trying to do, um, and I'll be get to that. Uh, I'll be getting that to that in a minute. One of the things that we've been trying to do is we've been trying to test different models. Uh, on our results, and we've been having a problem finding a model that that uh, 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 that um, uh, accounts for the the whole range of data, and that this might actually be the reason the reason for that. But I'll be getting back to that in a minute. Now it turns out that we are not the first people to observe something like that um, in our languages. Uh, Cindy Allen, in her book from 1995, she 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 notices the, exactly the same trend for alternating verbs in Old English. So she has for full and piece, she had almost like a 50-50 distribution between dative nominative and nominative dative. But when the uh, when the uh, uh, two arguments were pronouns, she got nominative dative in 100% of the cases. So this is something that this is something that really needs to be investigated further. Now um, I'm almost to the end of my presentation, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about. Uh, what we have found with the, with, uh, co uh, the computational techniques that we, have, that we are using, we have just started this part, so this is very preliminary. Uh, it turns out that when we use correspondence analysis, the dative case is clearly associated with animacy. And this is, of course, not surprising. We knew this. We knew that the dative is almost always, always animate. Now, what we did not know was that dative case is associated with first and second person, and this is irrespective of position. So the dative is, is basically usually or most often the first or second person. So dative is basically the speed sack participants. Now, um, then we uh, tried configurational frequency analysis, and there we found out that nominative arguments are almost always third person. And this is irrespective of uh, position. 
so this means either uh, either pronouns or 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 third person full and piece. Uh, dative case in first position uh, also clearly correlates with definiteness. So uh, it seems that definite NPs uh, um, tend to occur in uh, in the first position uh, as opposed to indefiniteness. Now, nominative third person arguments in first position are definite in the clear majority of cases. This is like a seventy-five or eighty. This is like seventy or eighty percent of the cases, something like that. Now, definite datives in second position are most often first, uh, first, first or second person. That, this, of course, we had figured out because uh, because uh, we saw that um, uh, that um, uh, that uh, datives are uh, usually in first and second person. Indefinite datives in second position are always third person. Nominatives in second position are always third person and in inanimate. So it seems that there is a correlation between uh, a second position and inanimacy. And then we tried simple logistic regression modeling. And there we found out that uh, second position uh, clearly correlates with inanimacy. Second position also correlates with the length so that uh, uh, the arguments in second position are uh, longer than the one in first position. And second position also correlates with indefiniteness. Now we were not able to establish uh, anything so, so extremely uh, meaningful for first position, but that's also probably because of this interfere of, the, of this mixed uh, situation that we have uh, a different kind of, uh, we have different argument structure chosen depending on whether the uh, arguments are nouns or full and piece, uh, whether they are pronouns or, or, or nouns. Um, but we will be continuing with this. And the mixed effect model yields uh, the same results as the simple logistic regression model. So to summarize so far, uh, dative nominative, or to summarize the whole presentation, because we are now at the end of the presentation, Dative nominative verbs in Icelandic divide between two, alternating and non-alternating. Um, dative nominative verbs in German are actually far more not numerous than we had hitherto assumed. Uh, and they fall more or less into the same semantic clusters uh, as we have in Icelandic. Now we have established a baseline with ordinary nominative dative verbs that demonstrates the ratio between neutral word order and topicalization. And we're first and foremost basing this on full and peace since because uh, in order to compare this with German, we um, we should just stick with full and peace because of the independent um, um, reasons, independent motivations for how pronouns uh, uh, order. Now, with neutral word order versus topicalization in, in Icelandic for uh, hjálpa verbs is 99% versus 1%. So this is for full and peace, as I said. Neutral word order versus topicalization for uh, 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 health verbs in German is 96 versus 4%. So for this particular verb class, we have like 1% uh, topicalization in Icelandic and 4% topicalization uh, in German. Now we have comparable results for non-alternating dative nominative verbs in Icelandic, the Lika verbs. Neutral word order, uh, uh, we find neutral word order uh, in 99.5% of the cases and topicalization in, in half a percent of the cases. And then we have these remarkable results uh, for alternating dative nominative and nominative dative verbs, uh, 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 which are Hetta and uh, Gesiemen verbs in Icelandic and German. So in Icelandic, we have 28% we have uh, 28 versus, uh, uh, so if we generalize across all the verb classes, we have 28% uh, dative nominative versus 72% dative uh, nominative dative. If we take out Hetta from the Icelandic class, uh, as Hetta was an outlier, we get uh, to the numbers 55 versus 45%. Now for German, uh, for the 10 verbs in German, because uh, it turns out that uh, that the second and the third that uh, the third class were both of the alternating types in German, we get the numbers 44 versus 56 percent, which is pretty similar to the Icelandic numbers that we had for for the Hatta class, excluding Hatta. So it seems pretty evident that German Kefalan verbs are in fact alternating dative nominative and nominative dative verbs, uh, and that either either argument, the dative or the nominative, pass the word order test. So both behave syntactically as subjects, but of course not at the same time, obviously. 
and verb class effect mask individual verb effects. So this is a, met a, a methodological um, conclusion that we that we um, uh, that we have shown that uh, there's a very there's a lot of alternation. There's a lot of variation, individual variation between the the uh, the verbs, so that even when we talk about verb classes, we also need to show the numbers for individual verbs. Now, oblique subjects in light of uh, word order distribution and frequencies. In Icelandic, we have non-alternating uh, plus alternating verbs. In German, we don't have non-alternating verbs. We have, uh, we have uh, only alternating verbs. And uh, either argument passes the word order test, so both behave syntactically as subjects. And so the numbers that, um, that I shown you with regard to uh, gefallen and gesiemen verbs shows that uh, that the numbers, uh, uh, the distribution, uh, the distribution of the of the arguments across uh, uh, positions, um, is totally uh, out of line uh, with the numbers for topicalizations. So um, it's Im basically impossible to uh, to say to analyze these as topicalized uh, uh, objects on the basis of these numbers, uh, as um, the numbers uh, rather speak for um, a subject analysis. And then one major deviation regarding the alternation in Icelandic that is found when both arguments are pronouns. Uh, then the nominative dative construction takes precedence over the dative nominative construction. And thank you. That's um, all I wanted to say. Okay. Thank you, Professor. That, that was an excellent talk. Uh, we have chosen three questions. Some of them were made in the very beginning of your presentation, but I'm going to make it. Uh, the first one, uh, uh, I have just put in the chat, so you can mm -hmm. read also if you have any doubt, but I'm going to mm -hmm. read out loud, okay? So mm -hmm. the first one, Bert Capel, 2006, considers some alternations as allostruction, like he did in his seminal study about phrasal verbs in English. Is it possible to interpret dative, nominative, nominative, dative verb alternations as allostructions, in your opinion, or it's not the case? Um, I guess you can. You can uh, view those as allostructions, but I don't really see what we gain by it. Okay. Um, um, we were discussing this the other day, um, and... Uh, the problem that we had with it was that um, actually now I don't remember what the problem with it was, but um, um, but you could say that these are these are uh, allostructions. Uh, but the yeah okay now I remember what the problem with it was. Uh, the problem is that um, um, uh, constructions are four meaning correspondences. And it's not really clear, you know, what the me what the what the differences in meaning are between those if we take those as all all structures, and we don't. It's not really clear either what the difference in meaning is between them, you know. Even though the we say that they're not all structures, but uh, um, but I don't actually see any gain in uh, talking about all structures. Um, I mean, we might as well talk about uh, constructional uh, uh, about alternation. Okay. Okay. Thanks. The second one is you have mentioned your third hypothesis about Icelandic verb alternation needs further explanation. Have you thought of dealing with experiments in order to check the psychological reality for alternations? Actually, that is uh, that is our plan. Okay. That is actually our ne next step in this research to do uh, psychological experiments. So we're we are collaborating with some linguists, some psycholinguists, and so uh, the next uh, thing we will be doing is to is to uh, is to carry out such experiments. Yes. Okay. And the last one is I I also would like to know if you believe there are pragmatic factors or priming effects that can come into play in choosing a specific alternation. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I, when I wrote that paper in 2001, uh, the only explanation that I could come up with with regard to uh, this alternation and the, cho and the speaker's choices between those two alternates um, is, would be to, uh, it basically has to do with topicality. 
So that my feeling was that we use the dative nominative construction if, it's the, if the dative is topical and we use the nominative dative construction if the nominative is topical. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's kind of difficult to kind of show that. I guess that we would need, uh, well, we now have uh, uh, 200 examples of uh, um, each of those uh, five verbs. Um, we could go through uh, uh, all of the examples and we would have to look at the greater context in order to uh, in order to um, uh, to figure out whether uh, this is the the uh, the uh, case, another way to try to deal with this is to kind of have a look at the definiteness versus indefiniteness, and pronouns versus full and piece, because that that is well, that we want would be one way of approaching topicality, um, and that's also something that we are doing. Um, but with regard to priming effects, well, I mean, as I said, of course, I mean, with regard to definiteness, that's in one way a, sen a sense of a priming effect. Um, if you use um, if you use the dative nominative construction because the dative is topical, then it has been mentioned in the previous context somehow. Uh, but if you think about priming proper in the sense of um, what kind of structures have been used in the previous discourse, um, I'm not really sure uh, to which case we would find such priming effects, but we, this is also something that can be checked uh, with an experiment, with the second yes. experiment. Experiment, I think yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, one of the things that we're trying to, that we are aiming to do is to kind of like let speakers, so to make a second linguistic experiment where we let speakers uh, uh, choose we give them words like uh, in an unor in an unordered way like in a triangle or something we give them uh, uh, words and we let them themselves choose how they put them together and uh, to see you know which of the argument uh, becomes the first argument and which of the argument which of the two becomes the second argument and uh, but there's also the possibility of uh, some sort of uh, doing some sort of priming uh, in those cases um and I think it might be a good idea to to both prime and non-prime to do a comparison there. Yeah. Okay. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. So once again, uh, we would like to express our gratitude to Professor Johanna Bardal. Okay. We hope we can sign new partnerships in the near future. We would like also to thank the audience for their participation. Okay, so goodbye to you all. <laughs> okay, thanks, Professor Johanna. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.